Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome all. Uh, thank you for joining today's event of our Share It community. Uh, my name is Mario Grimaldi. I'm a software developer in uh, ThoughtWorks and the Italy office, and uh, also a member of the team that is uh, organizing this uh, meetup. Um, I'll be the host today, but in the call, we also have uh, Ronnie Cesano and Vanessa Formicale that, that are also part of the, of the team. So before we deep dive into the talk, I don't want to steal too much time, but we like to do a brief introduction for the you know, newcomers and you know, to introduce ourselves. So let me share some slides that are always helpful. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. Um, so who are we? So let's start from who is ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is a global software consultancy company. And basically what we like to do is to solve complex problems for our customers with the support of technology. Among you know, many different values that we have uh, in our company, sharing knowledge is one of the uh, important one, and we do it in many different ways. So uh, we do it by publishing uh, books. Uh, you might know some of them. Uh, a lot of you know, smart colleagues have published interesting books on technology and other topics. We publish articles, speak at conferences, um, publish the technology radar, and organize uh, community and events like the one of the Share It community. But who is uh, Share It? Who are we? So our mission is to empower individuals and organizations uh, contributing to the community by bringing our own knowledge and sharing uh, our own experiences. And we do it by organizing talks on many different topics. You know, we might have uh, we might talk about architecture, software design, uh, security, uh, diversity and inclusion, agile team practices, and so on. We already had a few events. Uh, you might find the recording on our YouTube channel. We will share the links throughout the, the event. Um, and today we are going to have another interesting one. Before we start, just a small uh, parenthesis on the code of conduct that we have. So in, a, in one sentence, just be excellent to each other. Uh, remember that this evening we want to learn something new and uh, we want to have an engagement, engaging conversation among each other. So feel free to ask any question on the chat or the QA section. Uh, this will all be visible to the speaker, which is Matteo, and also to us and also to other participants. So it's also a nice way, you know, to exchange opinion and have a conversation on what we're hearing about. And finally, be kind and respectful, please, to each other. Uh, this is a safe place and we want it to be uh, that way. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, his name is Matteo Vaccari. He's a tech principal in ThoughtWorks in our Italy uh, office. And today he will talk to us about accelerate development with simple design. So over to you, Matteo. I stop sharing. Thank you, Mario. And uh, uh, I will start sharing my screen. So um, I think that everyone in this meeting, uh, who every one of us who deal with software development, we all have the same problem. And that problem is that uh, software is a uh, uh, rarely delivered at the time when the customer wants it. Usually, in most cases, we uh, have a hard time delivering the software on time when the customer wants it. And so what do we do about it? Now, um, these are three things that do not work. Uh, add more people usually does not work because uh, it takes uh, increases uh, more um, the cost of coordination. And then cutting corners does not work because if you lower the quality, eventually this uh, makes you slower and makes the problem wor worse. And same as uh, working long hours. Uh, now, um, the longer you work past the time when you're tired, the more mistakes you make and the more negative work you do because uh, um, you will uh, uh, have to clean up after the mistakes that uh, we make when, when we're tired. So what works? So the big uh, um, bet that uh, we do is that uh, one thing that works and works very well is to have a very high quality in our code bases. And uh, uh, this uh, recipe that was uh, shared by Kent Beck and others uh, around uh, the turn of the millennium 
uh, is still a very effective way to deliver high quality uh, in, in, in software. Now, uh, the part of all of these uh, set of practices that uh, I'm interested most here is uh, simple design because uh, of all of these, uh, with the possible exception of metaphor, is the um, least well explained, if not the least well understood. Now, what is simple? This is not an easy thing to answer. So, Kent Beck published the rules of simple design, which are very useful. They, uh, you can use them as a way to move forward in your code, but they're, they're, I, I believe they're not enough. They're not enough descriptive of uh, uh, what is the state towards which you should asp yes, aspiring to, to get. And uh, so if you want to be good at simple design, at software design, there are other sources that uh, you must uh, consult, other things you must learn. And uh, Kent Beck again, in a book that he published in 1997, writes uh, a more descriptive set of uh, properties that code has. And uh, in particular, one thing that strikes me uh, is uh, when you can extend the system solely by adding new objects without modifying existing objects. Now, this is powerful and uh, is something that uh, uh, resonates with uh, uh, something like the object closed principle. And uh, we'll talk a great deal a great deal more about this uh, in uh, what follows now let's start with the concrete problem so this uh, is typical of uh, the kind of code that uh, uh, we see every day in a normal code basis so this is a test and uh, the problem with the test is that it's very complicated so it takes a lot of time. It took a lot of time to write. It uh, takes a lot of time to maintain it whenever uh, this uh, card service does something new. And uh, it takes uh, a lot of head scratching to understand uh, why, why it's broken when it breaks. And uh, it might break many times over the life of the project because uh, there are many ways it can fail because it tests so many things. Okay, have you ever seen code like this in your code basis? Now, uh, the reason why this test is so complicated and it cannot be any simpler is that uh, the production code it tries to test uh, is uh, uh, just as complicated. This uh, code does at least five different things so assuming that the purpose of this code is in a generic uh, e-commerce, uh, adding an item to a shopping cart, we receive a command to add an item to the shopping cart, and uh, we need to check for availability of the object. Then we need to, and this is uh, step number one. Then uh, we uh, add the item to the cart. This is where we manipulate the domain object. So this is the real, heart of the operation that uh, this method is supposed to perform. It modifies a cart by adding an item. And then uh, it does uh, step number three, which is uh, adding a gift item, which is uh, some marketing, marketing uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, improving uh, retention or whatever, but still is important. And then there's a fraud detection service. Step number four that might uh, do something to uh, raise an alarm if there's uh, some concern about this uh, shopping cart. And then uh, finally, step number five is uh, persist the state of the cart, of the cart in uh, some uh, permanent storage. So at least five things. And if we want to test them all, we need to write uh, a seriously complicated test. We might 
break it down in a, a number of tests so that each of one does a single assertion, but this does not improve things a lot because uh, the setup still needs to be complicated. And uh, note the name of this test. It is add item to cart operation. Return OK, add gift item with no fraud alert. Now, return OK could also be not return OK. So that's at least two cases. Add gift item, it might not be added because uh, it is already in the cart. So it's another two, poss two possibility. With no fraud alert, uh, again, could be with fraud alert. So there's uh, uh, three uh, binary possibilities, which makes eight different tests if we want to test them all. And the maintenance cost of these tests starts to skyrocket. OK. Um, and so uh, we see this code, and we think that uh, uh, it's painful. But uh, uh, and, and we probably know how to, how to fix it. But uh, we hardly ever find people who takes the time to do it. And this is why these uh, uh, sort of methods keep uh, creeping up uh, in our code base. This is just one method. There are probably many other like these, uh, uh, even more complicated than this one. And the, the additional concern is that whenever marketing invents a new idea, uh, we'll have to modify this method. Whenever uh, they, some other concern is raised that is related to adding item to the cart, like, uh, I don't know, um, computing uh, customer uh, uh, bonus points, we'll have to add stuff to here. So this tells us that uh, this method will never be closed and finished. It will be a work in progress forever as long as this uh, uh, program, this application uh, is uh, useful. Okay. So, what can we do about this? There are a number of uh, uh, gurus who've, uh, who's, who, who invented. Uh, um, invented principles and produced excellent advice over the years. And uh, the first one that comes to my mind is that all modules should be open for extension and closed for modification, which is Bertrand Maillet, uh, published in 1988 and is known as the open closed principle. So uh, software should be uh, possible, should be extendable, so open but uh, should be possible to extend it without uh, changing it. So it should also be closed. And this method, uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion, this principle, there's a lot of confusion about uh, this, this principle because uh, some, says, uh, some, some people say that it is uh, only related to object-oriented uh, inheritance. And uh, some uh, intend it in a more broad way as uh, this uh, should be about uh, finding ways to make code extensible without modification, but not necessarily through inheritance, uh, maybe with uh, many other means. And in fact, inheritance is the least uh, desirable way to make uh, code extensible. Now, um, in the Patterns book, the famous Gang of Four book, uh, there's uh, this favor object composition over inheritance, which hints that uh, you should uh, uh, find ways to solve business problems uh, by composing several objects rather than uh, using inheritance to extend the lifetime, the, the, the functionality of objects. Kent Beck, already quoted, uh, David West uh, in object thinking, uh, again, makes a lot of deal about uh, um, object orientation being about uh, decomposing a problem in uh, many different uh, objects that can then be composed again to solve that problem and maybe maybe other that are similar. So uh, the goal would be to uh, arrive at a point when you have a, a collection of uh, primitives that you can uh, mount together in different ways, like Lego bricks, uh, to obtain different uh, uh, effects. And these is also related to the idea of a domain-specific language, which is uh, uh, 
can be as simple as uh, uh, having a number of object uh, modules that you can combine together. And then we go to uh, the present time when uh, functional programming proponents uh, say that functional programming is essentially about uh, uh, composition more than about functions, or maybe it's about composing functions and composing uh, is the important part. Now, all of these hints that uh, uh, there's an underlying principle that is the principle of compositionality. So we could uh, call it uh, compositionality, but I like open closed uh, uh, a bit more. So for the rest of this talk, uh, we'll talk about uh, the open close principle. And uh, uh, to me, the open close principle means uh, that uh, your system should be like this uh, motherboard. You should be able, or maybe it's a backplane. I'm not a hardware person, but you should be able to extend your system by plugging in different modules. And since this is software, the modules are software, and the backplane is also some software construct in your system that enables this plugin ability of your system. So this is how I define the open and close principle. New features should be coded new code files with no modification to existing code files. And this is not specifically about object oriented. I remember my first boss uh, almost uh, 30 years ago, it was a, an old school software engineer and he said uh, our most successful system that we built here was uh, built around the idea of uh, uh, a hardware backplane where you can plug in uh, hardware, hardware uh, um, boards and that system was written in Fortran. So you see that it's not specific to any particular language. And uh, so our goal here is to uh, organize software on backplanes. And this means that uh, we should be on the alert. When we see something that keeps growing, like uh, the method that we saw before, and we realize that uh, uh, the requirements keep arriving and every time uh, uh, we get a new requirement uh, this method keeps growing and we add another bit to it. Then is where we realize that our method, uh, this method or this function or this procedure or whatever it is, uh, is not closed. And we should do something. We should probably organize uh, a backplane that enables us to make that uh, um, that module, that uh, procedure, that function, that method uh, closed against these requirements that we see arriving. So this is not about uh, starting with backplanes. It's about arriving at backplanes, given that we see that our code is not closed with respect to the requirements that keep arriving. Okay, you with me so far? Uh, please uh, give me uh, a feedback. Uh, is everything clear so far in chat, if you please? Uh, or should I go back and clarify something? Thank you, Alessia. Is my English clear? <laughs> Am I speaking too, too fast? Thanks all folks, uh, I will continue. So um, why we want to be able to code everything in new code files uh, without modifying existing code files? Because then when uh, a feature must be removed, we can just uh, remove the files. When uh, we, a feature must be changed, we can uh, change uh, specific files without uh, risking impacting uh, other functionality that are uh, coded in other files. And uh, it's uh, also easier to test because uh, um, if the new, uh, imagine a new user story comes and user stories uh, can be implemented by adding a new plugin module in our backplane. Uh, this means that our unit tests 
are focused on that uh, new module that I'm writing, and uh, they will uh, be easy to write because uh, the module can be as simple as, uh, as needed just to solve uh, this feature. So we, uh, in order to achieve this pluginability, we must strive to make uh, all these uh, uh, plugins independent to one, in one another, and then uh, testing is also simplified. So uh, this principle, uh, it took me quite a while to understand. And uh, my way to understand uh, uh, new things uh, is to try to, uh, to, to, to blog about them and write exercises to uh, share with other people. So uh, teaching and learning uh, for me go together. So in 2010, after a conversation with Jacopo, who was on my team and uh, was uh, much more knowledgeable about software design than I was, he uh, in inspired me to go look back to the open source principle and learn more about it. So uh, I thought, can we invent an exercise that uh, will make it uh, possible to um, get practice at applying this principle. Uh, this exercise was uh, uh, then presented in many places. In London and Manchester, it was not me. And uh, um, after a while, uh, I, well, I, I could not hope that uh, by publishing this exercise, I would have solved uh, this problems of software engineering, of, of course, but uh, um, I think that uh, this exercise is still useful because uh, uh, whenever I see software at work, uh, I very often see instances of OCP not being applied, not being minded to. And uh, thanks, Indrit, for uh, your note. So what is the problem? Is that even though we know about the OCP, even though we know about design patterns and a lot of other techniques that are able to make our software decomposable, we don't apply it in practice. Why? Because we are not fluent. If you are in real work and you have pressure to deliver and you are stressed because you need to understand if your feature, their coding is right, if you understood it, understood it correctly, if uh, um, uh, you're going to deliver it in time. You have a, a number of pressures on you that um, makes it very difficult for you to apply anything that uh, you can't uh, uh, do automatically. So um, I'm told that uh, uh, in uh, military training in the US, they say that uh, when you're under fire, you go back to your training. If your training makes it automatic for you to do some things that you will do them, if uh, some things that require you to think about them and uh, spend time uh, reasoning how to achieve them, you will not do them with most likely. Okay, so uh, the problem, in my opinion, is uh, about uh, how we do training. So many developers uh, do code katas or uh, other kinds of exercises, which are really great uh, at improving skills. And uh, um, there's uh, only a problem that most katas uh, that are published and being uh, and are popular end up uh, with you uh, solving it uh, with a single object uh, and in many cases uh, even a single method. So in a way, uh, these are algorithmic exercises that push you towards uh, violating uh, the open source principle. They are useful for other ways, but they are not very useful for learning how to do OPC. So for instance, in uh, the left, you see the bowling game, which is a famous exercise that has been used by uh, the extreme programmer um, proponents uh, since the beginning, because it's just the right uh, level of complexity. And the version you see here has been popularized by Robert Martin in a very good uh, slide deck that I invite you to, to check out. 
And on the right, you see the FISBAS game, which is also another very popular exercise that uh, um, uh, is used for uh, training developers. Now, they're both uh, uh, single methods. Now, uh, what happens? In uh, the Uncle Bob uh, Robert Martin presentation, uh, he starts uh, with uh, a quick design session. He says, if I weren't uh, doing TDD, I would start uh, with uh, a design session. I would uh, formulate uh, uh, the need for a frame object uh, in a bowling. A frame uh, is uh, uh, the fact that you can, uh, uh, you are allowed to, uh, uh, how, how do you say, knock down uh, 10 pins using uh, two balls. So this is a frame. And uh, in bowling, you have uh, 10 frames and two balls per frame that uh, you can use to knock down those pins. And uh, the 10th frame is different because uh, in some cases, you might be allowed to use three balls instead of only two. And uh, uh, if uh, you were working before TDD, you might uh, uh, follow this quick design session with uh, writing these objects and then solving the problem with this initial design. But in TDD, we don't do this. In TDD, uh, we usually start uh, with the blank slate and uh, try to discover the, the structure as we go. And uh, um, both ways uh, work. So it's OK to do design sessions before working, but it's not OK to, uh, us to code for these design sessions immediately. It's good to see if. Uh, the design session you did uh, stands up to, um, to, to the test of uh, testing it, of writing it with the test. So uh, Robert Martin uh, discards the initial design and starts uh, uh, working from a blank slate, and it arrives at this code, which is remarkable, because if you read it, it reads a bit like the rules for scoring bowling. It says uh, for 10 frames, if uh, this frame is a strike, then your score is 10 plus the bonus of the strike, which is defined as where. Then uh, strike means uh, knocking down 10 pins with a single ball. If it is a spare, which means knocking down 10 pins with two balls, uh, you get 10 points plus a different bonus, and uh, else uh, the your score for this frame is the sum of all the pins you knock down with two balls. Yes, it reads like the rules, so it's readable, but uh, readability is not enough. In software de development, we need also modifiability. So is this software easy to modify? OK, this software, I believe it is fine as it is, uh, as long as you don't get new requirements. But what if you do? So uh, let's imagine some uh, easily imaginable extension to the rules of bowling. So what if the frames are 12? What, is, what if you have three balls per frame? What if uh, the number of frames is variable? What if the number of pins is variable? So. Um, if you start re receiving all these uh, uh, new requirements and you try to continue in the same way as we have here, what happens? What happens is you're likely to end up with a tangle of ifs, spaghetti code that is uh, unreadable and unmaintainable. Yes, you can brute force it because you have the tests, but still this code is uh, very bad. And uh, the reason uh, we are pushed towards uh, this uh, is that we have no, uh, no way, no easy way to extend the code without modifying it. And uh, installing a backplane here requires effort, so we don't do it. And uh, in a real life situation, we are likely to add one more if, rather than refactoring everything and risking to break uh, existing stuff. Uh, and uh, we are of course, under pressure to deliver. So um, this code is not so simple after all. Yes, it's readable, but it's not uh, 
flexible, it's not extensible. So I don't, I wouldn't call it simple. It is at the edge of readability, make it any more complicated and it's likely to uh, start being not so nice, not so easy to read. And what is uh, remarkable is that if we go back to the design session, we might have a source of good ideas on how to make this code more flexible. For instance, uh, the frame object uh, was a good idea because uh, many of these variations that I presented before can be solved by using uh, uh, a polymorphic frame object that has a score method. So every frame knows how to score itself and uh, you don't need to um, write a chain, on if, any, chain of if anymore. So this is one of the basic tricks of making code extensible, use polymorphism. At least one of, of the basic tricks of object-oriented programming. Other styles of programming have other tricks and they are all useful and um, there's no single way to make uh, this code flexible. It depends uh, on your uh, knowledge, skills, inclination, uh, preference, uh, and uh, a host of other things uh, like uh, uh, the knowledge, uh, preferences, and uh, inclination of your colleagues uh, and of the company you, you work with. So um, if we go back to the problem that we saw before, this is how we got here. Uh, this has no uh, extension mechanism, no backplane. So whenever a new requirements arrives, uh, someone says, I, this is the place where if I add an if, uh, this requirement will be implemented. So they go ahead and uh, add, the, add an if, and uh, the code becomes uh, steadily worse, especially the tests become steadily worse. Good. So any ideas? Uh, do you have uh, ideas on how to make uh, this code extensible? What uh, uh, ideas could we use to make, uh, to, to give a backplane to this method to make it uh, pluggable? Any suggestions? The state pattern suggests areas. Um, yes, probably. Um, it's not the first pattern I would try to use, but it depends on what you have in mind. Uh, in general, uh, the design patterns uh, can be interchangeable in a way. So uh, you could, uh, uh, for instance, uh, use uh, um, a chain of decorators, but also chain of responsibility, but also uh, adapters, but also uh, publish, subscribe. So these are all patterns that could work here. Um, okay, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm told that I'm not reading the comments, so. Um, so this suggestion I saw was about using the state pattern. Thank you, Arjan. Okay. Uh, let's see a bit how the open closed principle cutoff works. So the idea is that you start from the end of a normal kata. So you uh, arrived at a solution that probably has a single object with a single important method. And then you try to break uh, the code by adding a new requirement that forces you to add an if. Now, if you can make it pass by only adding new classes without changing any existing code, except uh, the place where you construct the graph of objects, well, then uh, you're okay and you should find a, a more difficult requirement. Otherwise, 
you should disable the new test and refactor the code in order to be able to implement the new requirement without uh, changing existing code. So this is the idea. Uh, if uh, you can't uh, go without uh, changing existing code, uh, stop. Don't try to make the system flexible and add a new requirement at the same time. Uh, we separate uh, in TDD. Refactoring is clearly separated from uh, new functionality. So uh, if we try to do both, uh, it is going to be a lot more difficult. So we disable the new test, go back to green bar, and we refactor the system towards compositionality, towards installing the backplane. When the backplane is ready, then we enable again the test that was uh, problematic, and then we make it pass. And if the black plane works, it will be easy to make it pass. And uh, uh, this is uh, about, uh, you know, TDD is uh, three steps, write a test, make it pass, and then refactor. But this is a cycle. So refactor can also come before writing the test or before you try to make the, uh, make the new test pass. So a good strategy in general is to uh, deal with any difficult requirement by saying to yourself, why is the requirement difficult? Is it difficult because my code does not support it well? And uh, yes, it is because my code base does not support this new requirement well. So if I just had thought about it earlier, I could have built uh, the extension point I need to make it easy to change to add this requirement. Okay, but we don't do that because we don't try to anticipate requirements in in a TDD. So um, we pretend we knew it from before, and we um, apply the backplane now. And then when the new uh, the code is refactored and is easy to change, we make the easy change. So uh, an example is that we take the FizzBuzz game. So these are the tests. Uh, the FizzBuzz game is a very simple game that where you count from one to, to 100. And whenever the number is a multiple of three, you say Fizz. Whenever it's a multiple of five, you say buzz. And whenever it's a multiple of both, you say fizz buzz. So we implement the same method that implements this logic. And it's most likely a chain of ifs. Now we invent a requirement that breaks this logic. For instance, if this is a multiple of seven, say bang. Now, uh, if we try to implement it now, can we do it by adding new classes with no modification to existing classes? Question to the audience. Do you think you can implement this new requirement without modifying existing code? Paolo says no. Who else? Christian says no. Micromag. OK, Micromag says, yes, it can be open. I can uh, call the old say when, uh, it's an, when it's not a multiple of seven. So the idea would be that we have a new object that wraps the physical game and intercepts the say method. If it's a multiple of seven, says uh, it says, uh, uh, bang, otherwise it delegates to the old game. Very nice, very nice. So it would seem that in a way, uh, these, um, there's a way to extend it by using the uh, decorator pattern. Decorator says uh, you create another object that has the same interface as the old one, and it does something. Very cool. But this is not the way I've done it uh, in this presentation. So there's many ways of doing it. This one is very cool. And I've seen it uh, 
now that I remember in some uh, dojos, uh, I've seen it uh, used uh, in this way and it was a very cool solution. But this is another solution I want to show you today. So um, uh, we disabled the new test because we think we cannot and we start refactoring. So the first refactoring is that we go after duplication. You see that is multiple of three is repeated two times and also is multiple of five is repeated five two times. So um, the first idea is to uh, create uh, an accumulator variable response and uh, use it to get rid of one of these. And uh, the test for multiple of seven is still disabled. So we are in green bar. Then we can uh, uh, extract the logic of is multiple of into um, this, this, the two ifs can be uh, extracted to methods as a preliminary step to make them look uh, as uh, similar as possible. So we extract methods and then we generalize the method. So uh, we have a single method, say word, where that takes uh, the, the number that we need to analyze, uh, the divisor and the string we have to uh, pronounce if uh, it, the, the condition is uh, fulfilled. And, and um, so we uh, now have a single method, say word, but still we are not uh, closed because uh, if we want to add something about uh, number, the, the multiples of seven, we still have to add the line to the same method. And uh, the next step would be to invent an object that we can compose. So word rule uh, inherits uh, the same method that uh, before we had uh, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a separate uh, method inside the, the previous object. And now we are close. Now we have these objects, so we can pass to the FizzBuzz game a list of rules. The FizzBuzz game must execute the rules one at a time. And uh, this enables us to add a new rule to the list of rules that we pass to the game in order to make it, uh, in, to construct it. So here in the setup, this is the construction, construction code. So construction code is uh, fair. You can uh, change construction code. So the refactoring here becomes uh, simply adding a new word rule to the FizzBuzz game. And now the test for multiples of seven passes. So this is an example by using objects. When we go back, oh, there's a comment here. Okay, uh, question is, uh, if um, the number is 21, you have to print a bank fits exactly. Uh, we didn't write a test for this, but uh, this code will work. Uh, so by the way it's constructed, this uh, will also uh, print uh, uh, fits bang, uh, fits buzz bang, uh, buzz and bang, ba <laughs> sorry, I'm getting confused, all the combinations. And uh, if this is uh, what is uh, intended, if this is not what we, what is intended, then uh, the requirement is more complicated. Okay, cool. Now, let's go back to the original problem. If I was um, trying to solve this problem at work, one thing I could do is to do, go to the whiteboard. Aha, I haven't seen a real whiteboard in uh, one and a half years, but uh, I, I miss them a lot. But um, we could uh, use mural or uh, Miro or something like this to sketch a solution. And uh, uh, sorry, we could sketch a solution of, uh, for instance, uh, identifying all the steps as a first uh, step, and then uh, try to imagine how we could uh, uh, implement them as a separate. Uh, 
methods, object, modules, whatever. So if uh, you are an object-oriented uh, person, or rather, if you have an object-oriented perspective, then uh, you could use uh, some pattern like decorator, as uh, I was suggested before by uh, Micromag84. And uh, if you are uh, have a functional programming perspective, you could imagine a composition of functions. So these books and many others provide a host of ideas on uh, how to decompose a system into objects or functions. So I invite you to uh, read them if you haven't already. And uh, in this case, uh, so this uh, problem I show you here uh, is, uh, let's say, um, an abstraction of a concrete problem that we had at work uh, a while back. So uh, initially we solved it uh, with the chain of decorators, but eventually we uh, refactored them towards uh, um, a composition of functions. Now, in um, let's see the solution with functions. So um, a function in mathematics is written uh, like f colon a arrow b. So meaning that the function is a function from type A to type B. In Java, we have the function type, which is a parameter generic and has two type parameters. In this case, uh, the operation of responding to an add item to cart command can be seen as a function. You have a, a, an add item to cart command in, uh, in the input and an add item to cart result in the output as an output. And so you could imagine this as a function from uh, this type, uh, add item to cart, uh, command to result. And uh, uh, the nice thing about functions is that they can be composed. So in uh, math notation, uh, you use the, the small cir circle. In Java, you can use the and then method. So if we try to compose our service with many small functional steps, we end up with something like this. So every step is a function from some type to another. All that matters is that in the chain of functions, you all the types match. So the output type of one function should be same as the input type of the next one in the chain. And this uh, is one way to achieve uh, the open close principle in this case. And uh, we've been using this quite extensively. So in my current project, uh, we have uh, used extensively this functional idea, but not only this one, because uh, there's more than one uh, um, backplane in uh, any realistic system. For instance, if you're using Java and the Servlet uh, API, you already have one backplane, which is the web uh, HTTP filter mechanism. So uh, you can uh, uh, attach a filter that will uh, examine your request and uh, then your response. Uh, and so it's able to um, intercept the request, decide if to continue or to do something else, and then it can intercept the response and decide what to do with it. So um, the web filter is a kind of a decorator pattern again, and it's built in uh, in uh, most uh, Java frameworks. And uh, in our current project, we have uh, at least uh, six or seven or eight backplanes that we use in different places to achieve different uh, uh, effects. So we have the functional uh, backplane where uh, every request has a chain of function, but also we have uh, um, a backplane for enriching uh, outgoing requests. So whenever we call another microservice from our microservice, then we want to add, uh, I don't know, uh, authentication headers, uh, uh, tracing uh, headers, uh, authentication headers, and um, we want maybe to log the uh, request and the response. So uh, all of this is achieved with the composition of filters on the outgoing HTTP request. And uh, 
Um, there's more than one way to do it. Of course, uh, you can use uh, different uh, techniques uh, to achieve this, but the key thing is uh, go for the open closed. Uh, whenever you see something that keeps growing, you should do something about it to make it manageable, especially when you see uh, tests that are very difficult to write and maintain because they are too complicated. This is the, the, uh, a big red flag that tells you I should do something to simplify my production code. Okay, we have a question from Arjun. Usually in these scenarios, how do we, how do we handle errors or validations from different operations? Um, so um, there are more than one way, one way to do it. The way we do it uh, in our system is to keep it simple. So uh, we are not doing uh, uh, functional programming all the way. So uh, one of our steps is allowed to throw an exception. For instance, if at some point you have a validation error, you throw an exception that eventually becomes a 400 bad request response to the caller. And this is not functional, of course, but uh, it works. And it's, uh, in uh, our opinion, much simpler than uh, using uh, uh, monads to uh, make sure that uh, your functions are really behave like functions because uh, it's uh, a bit... Uh, um, it's not easily achievable because many of our steps do some things like going outside to another service to get information. So they can never be pure functional because they have side effects of calling something else and that something else can return different answers every time. So it's not functional, but it behaves like a functional. It composes like a functional function. So you can uh, um, use as much functional programming uh, Kung Fu as uh, you uh, think is appropriate to your situation. So um, in our case, uh, we regard it as functional because uh, in, under the assumption that everything goes well, it is functional. If something does not go well, uh, an exception will be uh, handled at the outermost most, uh, layer by the framework and will be transformed as appropriately into a 400 or a 500 or a 503 or a 403 or whatever is appropriate for the exception. And uh, um, Then the tests, the tests become much more simple because they deal with only one thing at a time. Now, um, conclusion and then questions. My main point here are two. Um, same for logging, asks Gregorio Fernandez. So yeah, you can do logging in the same way. So. If you uh, want to log, the functional programming way would be to return uh, an object that is a composition of your real answer and a collection of uh, strings, which are your log uh, strings. And if you do this, then your function becomes more complicated because uh, it's no longer a function from a command to response, but it's a, it's a function from a command to a composition of log lines and response. And there are ways in functional programming to deal with this, and it can be done. Uh, in our case, uh, we do it uh, uh, partially in one way and partially in the other. Why? Because uh, at some point uh, we decided that uh, log lines uh, should be uh, certain events, let's say, not log lines, but events should be logged uh, to a database. And uh, uh, it is not efficient to uh, publish a uh, hundred. Um, IS inserts in the database as they happen. So we collect uh, log lines uh, in uh, this result object, which is uh, a collection of uh, uh, events and the real response. And uh, at some point uh, we stop and we publish all the events on uh, an event publisher, which uh, takes care of logging on the database and on uh, log4j. And uh, uh, simplifies back the complex result into a simple result. So it throws away 
the, the events because they've been handled and return to the simple view of just the response. So you can combine the two approaches as you want, as is appropriate to your case. So two points in this talk. The first one is uh, OCP, be cognizant, be uh, alert for when things grow continuously through the life of your pro project. Find a way to make uh, uh, the thing that grows uh, should be the construction code here. So it's okay that you keep growing here the code because this is the composition, the construction code, but it's not okay if any class or method keeps growing. Uh, perhaps uh, you will not find a way to solve all these uh, problems, but you should uh, uh, consider adding a backplane every time you see this. And the second point is that fluency. If you're not fluent, you will not be able to do this at work. So um, these are a collection of resources. I also add uh, a jazz uh, piano book uh, because uh, uh, I want to point out that uh, every complex skill is achieved by exercising. And exercises are about repetition. So not mindless repetition. You don't play scales mindlessly. If you want to get good at playing an instrument, you play scales uh, mindfully. You want to uh, see every time how your fingers react to what you're doing. And it's the same with uh, programming exercises. So uh, it's good not just to do one exercise, one kata. Uh, it's good to do it more times, maybe three times, maybe four times, and see how our solution changes over time. See how we can solve it in different ways and learn different things. This buzz is a really good one to start because it's very flexible. The logic is so simple and you can bend it to explore so many different aspects of programming as you want. And uh, uh, this uh, coding dojo handbook is very good. And uh, the global day of code retreat is also very good. I am not sure if they are doing it uh, in Italy. Uh, I know some people like Gabriele Lana is excellent at uh, uh, organizing these. So if uh, there's a code retreat near you, uh, please uh, uh, consider attending because they are very useful. And uh, so start, start doing it. The uh, OCP kata is just about uh, choose a kata, solve it, and now try to break it with a new requirement. Cool. Um, any questions or objections or uh, observations? I would love to hear from you. Come on. No questions? Uh, it's also cool to say that it's a load of nonsense to you. If uh, you disagree, feel free. Well, probably if you disagree, you didn't stay here for, you know, all, all the time to the, to, the end, to the end. Okay. If there are no questions. Okay, one question. Okay, this is a good uh, objection. Gregorio Fernandez says, isn't simpler, is, isn't it simpler to concatenate a statement than a composition? Okay, so if I understand correctly, the objection is this. So if you go back to the old, um, so to this version of FitzBuzz, isn't it simpler to add an if than building the backplane? Um, okay, uh, let me um, say this, uh, whatever I say, whatever any person who tries to teach you things about how to write software, whatever rules, uh, dogmas, uh, or uh, principles that they try to push on you, uh, observation is more important. Observation is more important than any rule about good design that you might have heard 
because if you apply the rule and uh, the code that turns out to be horrible, then uh, it's best not to apply the rule. So maybe the rule was not applicable to this particular case and you learn something. Maybe the rule must be applied differently. Maybe the rule is wrong. Uh, but uh, the most important thing is that you observe the results you get and uh, you decide based on the results, not based on what uh, any uh, person is uh, trying to tell you on YouTube or uh, whatever, on, or on books. Having said that, uh, the problem with adding multiple methods, multiple calls in the same methods, yes, it can be simpler in some situation. Um, consider what happens if uh, uh, your tests start to grow and become unwieldy. So in this case, uh, in the case of uh, uh, the test that we were looking at before, sorry for the flickering. So the test, uh, that uh, we uh, see here is very complicated and very high maintenance. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's clear to me that uh, adding more code to this method is not simpler. It's making things much worse. And one hint here is that uh, all these lines of code are all different. So there are different concerns. Every addition has a different shape. This tells you that probably uh, adding more code here is not a good idea. On the other hand, if your code is uniform, so you have a series of calls that uh, um, have all the same shape and uh, the, your code looks almost like uh, a table, then it might be okay. Uh, it's more likely to be, it's more likely not to be a problem in that case. So of course, uh, um, use your judgment, but uh, I challenge uh, this, uh, uh, Gregorio. Uh, if uh, you're skilled in applying the open close principle, then you have a choice. Given your judgment, you can say, oh, here I could use this cool object-oriented or functional technique to decompose the code, but I don't do it because I think it's simpler this way. And this is a choice, but if you're not fluent uh, applying these techniques, then it's not a choice. It's uh, you're forced to go with the, uh, the um, single method version. I don't know if I was uh, clear. So Paolo says, uh, okay, uh, Paolo Shara says, uh, would it be better to use our own classes instead of using directly the function class from Java? In our, your example, I could create a step interface. Yes, it's, all, uh, uh, it's also a good way to do it. Is it better? I don't know, you know, uh, better depends on the context. It's good that you have different options. And um, in our case, uh, um, it worked well. Um, I, I can imagine that if you're, okay, in our case, the problem looked a lot like a pipeline of processing. So the function uh, approach worked well. If uh, you are composing things that are not uh, just input and output, but they are, are a bit more complicated, then the interface of each single thing might uh, uh, not be functional, might have two methods, for instance. In this case, uh, the function uh, class does not work, and here you need to define your own abstraction, your own step interface. It depends on your context, so it's a good observation. Thanks. What else? I will leave you with, uh, sorry for the flickering again. I will leave you with uh, uh, a list of resources. So um, the first one is the least useful. The OCP Kata repository is uh, a relic. You, you don't need it. Uh, the coding ha dojo handbook is uh, really good because uh, it tells you everything from uh, how to organize your own personal practice to how to organize it uh, in your company. Okay, Federico Valencia asks, how does the resulting test for the shopping cart would look like after refactoring with function composition? Okay, 
Uh, let me go back. So this is a one of the tests. So if you have this composition, one thing that you can do is you can test every one of these five objects separately. Then you have the problem of proving that when uh, these objects are all uh, mm, combined together, they perform as intended. And this can be uh, achieved in uh, several ways. One way is to have uh, a few, not many, but a few end-to-end -end tests that uh, test the system as a whole. Because for instance, if uh, um, the composition does not work in a spectacular way, then the end-to-end uh, -end test will notice and will break. It's more tricky when you have some effects that depend on the order in which you compose the objects, in which case the objects are not really uh, independent and decoupled as you wanted, but it might be inevitable in, this, in some cases. So another way is to not do a full end-to-end -end test that uses uh, the spring Mm, the spring uh, in the spring uh, runtime to in the spring context to run the test. So don't start a web server every time to uh, perform uh, these tests. You can uh, mount uh, use the same uh, configuration function here. Add item to cart service that builds the function as a composition. You can uh, uh, call it in a unit test. And then you can exercise the resulting composition. We do uh, all of these things in our current project. So we do have a few, maybe six or seven end-to-end uh, -end tests that uh, test the system using uh, the Spring context and start a web service. And they are slow and they are difficult to debug when they fail, but they are very useful because they saved us many times. And we also have uh, some tests for the composition of objects that are uh, unit tests, so no um, fast tests, let's say, tests that uh, do not require you to start uh, a web server. And uh, these are also very useful because uh, we can uh, write as many as we need of those because they're not expensive. But one important thing is that in most cases, uh, new requirements are implemented in a single object. So we don't need to test the composition because that single object solves the problem and we can use a, a very fast unit test on that object rather than on the composition. And this is an, an, a, a side effect of a practicing uh, this uh, separation of concerns, uh, this uh, open close principle uh, at scale that uh, uh, over time requirements uh, start being implemented as a, hey, this new requirement requires me to write a new type of X and plug it in, exactly as Kent Beck was saying at the beginning. So I'm very pleased with the result. And uh, we're back to the resources. So uh, I already said about code retreats and the next one is November. And uh, there's a, a website, there's a collection of exercises to try, but you can invent your own. And uh, one presentation that I find that is very nice is this one by Freeman and Price. Uh, Freeman and Price are really uh, aces at uh, writing uh, compositional code. I would suggest you to look up everything that they wrote or uh, published or uh, um, any presentation by them because they're very inspiring. And uh, one, this presentation, uh, I think is the one where they explain that uh, uh, the code was uh, refactored so much that in the end, uh, the composition of object was a DSL that could be validated by domain experts directly. So no need to write the test anymore because now the composition of object is validated by the domain experts who can say, yes, this is the rule correct, the correct rule. Uh, this is all. Okay, one uh, question from Gregorio, one last question. So Gregorio says, should be enough to introduce a test that verifies that all the steps are applied in expected order. Okay, if uh, you see this, uh, 
you could test it by saying, uh, okay, I want to test that the result of this function is uh, a composition of five objects. And the first one is uh, the check inventory type. The second one is the add item to cart type and so on and so on. And this uh, leads to a test that is a mirror of the production code. So whenever you add a new step to the production code, you have to add a new statement to the test and the two proceed in sync. And in the end, this test is not useful. Why? Because it says the same thing of the production code in the same way. A test is useful when it arrives at the, the result in a different way than the production code. So that like in double entry accounting, you arrive the same result in two different ways. The production code does it one way, the test does it in another way. And uh, this uh, gives you uh, assurance that uh, the code is correct. Because if your test code is a mirror of the production code and uh, the steps are in the wrong order in production code, you can uh, make the same mistake in the test code. And then uh, the test passes, but the code is wrong. So I, I do not advise to uh, apply this kind of tests. So be on the lookout. If your test code uh, looks like as the same structure as the production code, then it's probably not very useful. So thank you folks. It's been a great pleasure to, to be with you tonight. Great, Matteo. It was a super interesting one. This is my second time listening to this talk, but it was still a lot of insights for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Too so kind, Mario. Okay, a few, you know, end of call information just for, uh, you know, all of you. Um, both recording of this call and also the slides will be shared in the following days. We will send out an email through the Meetup channel. Um, if I can share, Matteo, just a, a few slides before we, we, prove, we wrap sure. up, no problem. Thank you. Okay, let me quickly share, folks. Okay. Cool. So just a few, uh, you know, logistic information for the next event. So in November, we will uh, have as a guest Keith Morris uh, with Scaling Infrastructure as Code. Keith Morris is a uh, principal in UK, uh, and he has a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, insights and information for us about the cloud and infrastructure as code. He's also the author of a book called Infrastructure as Code. And on November 25th, we will have him as a, a guest. So uh, I think we already published the meetup and you can uh, um, join there and we will publish, of course, uh, the URL of the uh, live event uh, when we were approaching the 25th. And finally, feedback uh, in the mail that we will send out uh, in the following days. We will also, you know, attach a, a small URL with a feedback form. It is very, very important for us to hear from you, understand what, where we can improve, what we can do better in terms of topic, but also, you know, the way we, um, we bring this content to you. So please, if you have any comment, uh, leave, leave one to us on, uh, on the feedback form. And I think that is all. So... Thank you all very much for joining and thanks again to Matteo.